So yeah, welcome to the QTB. Uh, I was originally going to be presenting this with my colleague Nick Hines, who's been unable to make it today, unfortunately. So hopefully, uh, I'll, I'll do the material uh, justice. Um, so uh, probably a little bit of a, um, a, a rather aggressive subtitle to the QTB this week. Somebody somewhere is plotting to steal your business. Now, we're not going to tell you that we know secretly about all of your competitors and that that's actually happening. This is more of a general point. Hopefully, we'll make that throughout the presentation. Uh, as Gary said, I'm, I am the practice lead. Uh, my official title, in as much as anybody in ThoughtWorks has official job titles, is Continuous Delivery Practice Lead for Europe. In practice, that means I uh, cover things like DevOps um, and cloud, especially, is one of my passions, although it's, it's sort of orthogonal to all the continuous delivery stuff, but we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on. Um, we should probably talk about why we're here. Uh, we're not just... Uh, what, why, what is continuous delivery? Why do we care about what it is right now? And I think probably if we start talking about what it is, we should think about the market we're in at the moment. Um, probably I would be very, very surprised if at least some of you out there, and probably most of you in this room, aren't aware of who your competitors are and are probably a little bit worried about them. Or at least you should be. Right? The first dot-com boom, there were lots of these predictions of doom and disaster for the red brick companies out there. All of these businesses online were going to come and take away our business with their little animated gifs of the workmen, you know, site under construction and all these sorts of things. In reality, some of our organisations, some of our high street stores did get affected by those sorts of first dot-com booms. Uh, we've seen the restructuring recently for things like HMV. It's, it's a kind of standard retail sector more than anything else and maybe some of the banking sector. But in reality, that was, the, that was the impact of the internet and most of our organisations out there were able to embrace the internet and take advantage of them. Um, but we are seeing a deeper and deeper penetration into standard enterprise spaces, into standard bricks and mortar, blue chip companies. I had a, a really interesting conversation recently with a, uh, with a small group of people who were in the, in the realm of investor relations. Uh, and it was a very small PHP-based startup, and they were doing investor relations. And they were doing it better than Bloomberg, and they were doing it better than Thomson Reuters. These aren't standard startups we're thinking of anymore. Uh, many of you out there will be facing competition, if not now, very soon, from very small, very nimble startups. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today are the kinds of things that they do to get their competitive advantage, and hopefully how you can use some of those same practices. Um, it's also a time of evolving businesses. I'm sure many of you have probably read Harvard Business Reports about pivoting, turning on a dime to do some new sort of business. This is, this is all the rage at the moment, and, uh, and quite understandably so. The idea that you can see a new business opportunity, take advantage of it, and potentially change the nature of your business in short order uh, is a very hot topic at the moment. Uh, part of it is driven by technology, things like apps and the App Store, I suspect most of you out here have smartphones. I'll even accept Android devices as smartphones, as an Apple fan. Blackberries don't count. But if you do have a, you know, a, 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 an app, an app ready phone out there, I wonder how many of you when, you, when you look to buy an application, your 59 pence application, I wonder how many of you actually look at how many times that application has had a new rollout of features. It's almost like even with a 59 pence purchase that I'm making impulse down the pub while I'm waiting for my friends, I'm thinking, well, how many times have they updated features for, oh, quite a few. I'll get that because I'm going to get some more things for it. We've also had to move away from off-the-shelf packaged software towards licensed software, software as a service. People are expecting you to deliver new features to your customers. And you know what? You expect it already. Every time you're on Facebook, I mean, if you're on Facebook and they hadn't released a new feature in six months, you start thinking it was getting old and stale. You don't have training courses either every time they release a new feature. Uh, a new button appears, and you kind of work out how to use it. And, and you know, this is stuff that the, the startup movement and the general wider internet companies have been doing for, for years. And it's stuff that you're going to have to embrace too, because if you don't, again, your competitors will too. Uh, there's also more people are moving away from focus groups and doing purely focus groups and market research and all these sorts of things and saying, well, you know what, when we go to these small groups of people that have... A self-selecting audience. We ask them questions. Uh, we have some market research firm go out and poll. They see a small fraction of our potential user base. And they come back with some information and some analysis and some research and there's some ideas about what they have. And that stuff might take, you know, 
few months to get back information for me about some new opportunity I might want to investigate in. And I, you know what? I think about that. I build the site. I put it out there. I build my product. I ship it to my customers. And I get feedback. And I found out that quite often what I was told in that stage does not match what's happening in the marketplace. Because ultimately, what happens in the marketplace is the truth. What happens when users actually use your system is the truth. It's somewhat akin for me when I was a developer. Well, I still am a developer. I'll take that back. Gary, Gary's hearing this sort of stuff and thinking, oh, he's getting ragging for being post-technical. Um, when I was a developer and didn't use to write tests, I would look at my code and I would try and pretend I was the computer and I'd say, you know what, that code's going to do what I think it should do. And then I'd run it and find I'd get bugs because actually I'm not very good at knowing what a computer does. So then I'd write a test and the test would be run by a computer because computers are very good at working out what computers know about. It's the same thing for your business models. It's the same thing for your products. If you put the product into the market and find out what the market wants, what the market does, how the market reacts, you're getting closer to truth. A really concrete example of something that Google did, if you've got a side, you know, you use sidebar ads you see from Google AdWords, and you can click through, um, and they, they, they give you money, and they make money, and everyone's happy. Um, they give you advice about what color of blue to put behind the sidebar, and it is, I believe, a shade of blue. It's not even just like, oh, it's, a, it's blue. It's, no, it's a certain hex code of blue. And the reason they know that is because they keep pushing out small, incremental, different hues for different users on different sites and have gathered a huge amount of data about what blue is most likely to get a click through. Amazon don't sit there for three months uh, with some UX consultancy working out do I put baby products above pharmaceutical products in Amazon? Not that they sell pharmaceutical products, but bathtubs. They don't do that. They'll make a very quick tweak, stick it out, and, and deploy the software, see what happens, do it again, do it again, do it again. Because the market is the truth. Your customers are the truth. So this all sounds lovely. Um, what's, what's continuous delivery, then? What is continuous delivery? Um, how many of you... Uh, are practicing what we call sort of continuous integration, that sort of thing, of the techie people in the room. There's a few. It's probably standard, right? Okay. So a lot of people will be thinking when we see continuous delivery, and certainly when we talk about the engineering practices around continuous delivery, and engineering practice is only a part of what we're talking about. It, it, the first question is, what's different from that side? Well, the key thing is it's really the automation of the last mile. I'd imagine many of you in this room are probably running agile projects. You probably track what's called sometimes dev complete. You track how many points has my development team completed. Maybe you even track how many points worth of things have my QA team finished off and signed off and give a big tick to. You know what? It's kind of, you know, as okay, it's a bit of information. It's kind of useless, though, because that's not in production. All too often, the reason we are tracking those things is because the moment we get the QA sign off, the moment we get the development saying they're done, it hits a brick wall because then it moves into a different space, a different world. It's a different pe group of people are picking up that software and then moving it into a production environment. So core to continuous delivery is the idea that automation doesn't stop where the developer or the QA stops. It moves all the way through to production. It's, it's about automating that last mile. We'll talk about some of the, the new things that have happened to allow this. It's also about rapid incremental delivery of high-value high features to your customers. We're all doing this, of course. Um, I've spoken to a few people who say, yeah, we're doing twice-weekly releases. We're doing this. And I say, OK, great. You're releasing every two weeks. And you're doing, releasing every two weeks in a reliable fashion. You know, that's a very good place to be. But that feature that you are deploying every two weeks, when did someone come up with that idea? Did they come up with it two weeks ago? Or did they come up with that six months ago? All too often, you're releasing frequently, but the software you're releasing was something that someone came up with six months ago, even sometimes longer. And, and the third thing, and I think the, thing that, the key thing, is the idea of continuously measuring all that your entire delivery process. And we are talking about a delivery process, a delivery process of software from the moment it, uh, as someone thinks of an idea to the moment it gets into production and back again. Measuring that, understanding where the defect rates are. I mean, this is all just value chain analysis stuff. This is straight out of the lead manufacturing books. And then optimizing that delivery process to change it to be something else. Um, 
What are the benefits of, of, of pulling all of these sorts of practices together? Um, we're first talking about predictability. Uh, if you're measuring your cycle times and uh, you're, you're tracking that whole through thing through the process and you're automating absolutely everything, um, it's pretty predictable what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. The reason you know what's going to happen is because you've got huge amounts of data that tell you about what's going to happen. If you're deploying into production once every six months, you get one data point every six months about what that process is like. If you're deploying into a production environment once every two weeks, once every week, five times a day, and some people do five times a day, um, you get a huge amount of predictable, uh, predictability about your whole process flow. Means when someone comes up with an idea, putting a business case together, can work out how long it takes. All too often we know, okay, a five-point story will take me four weeks to develop. We don't necessarily know how long it will take to deliver. You also get reliability, because if you're doing these things lots and lots and lots of times, you get very, very good at it. Please note, this is not a British train. Uh, part of the reason I was late here is because I couldn't predictably work out how long it would take me to get here, and then I used an unreliable form of transport, namely the Hammersmith and City line that got stuck outside uh, Edgware Road. Um, if you're doing something a lot, and you're automating something you do a lot, it becomes very reliable, uh, because you know, you don't want to be doing an unreliable thing. All, all, all too often we see something that's painful, the release process, the manual configuration of huge vast numbers of servers is such a painful activity that we hold off doing it. We leave it to once every six months, once every year. What happens? It doesn't get any less painful. It becomes daunting. When something becomes daunting, you don't want to do it pushes you to bigger release cycles. Bigger release cycles mean larger pieces of software going into production. Large pieces of software going into production, large deltas between this release and the last release are risk. Simple as that. Talk to any operations department, any release engineers out there, they would rather have a small incremental change to deploy than a giant whopping thing. Um, this could be contentious if you're IT focused or a really great idea if you're business focused. It depends on your point of view. Um, if you've automated absolutely everything and you've got the ability to come up with a new idea and you've got the ability to press a button and have that go into production, why don't you just give that big button to your business stakeholder? A lot of what we're talking about, certainly in the engineering practice and the software delivery lifecycle practices, is trying to, to stop IT being the bottleneck in an idea getting into production. Well, what we're actually talking about here is then really highlighting other issues in the wider business. Often when, when I talk to people about these kinds of things, they say, yeah, yeah, but I've got to do training for my customers, and there's a whole lot of sales activities and marketing activities. And, and you know what? They may be genuine, genuine constraints. A lot of what we're talking about here, though, is addressing those things that we can address. It's around the engineering discipline. It's about the idea to software creation lifecycle. That's the stuff we're talking about here. Um, I do want to get a ThoughtWorks branded USB button, one of these little plastic lids, you put a key in, flip it up, and you press a button, and nuclear missiles go off, but you know, version two for that sort of thing. Um, it's also about uh, very, very fast feedback. If you can get your software into production quickly, you get feedback you know, today, tomorrow, the day after, about how that thing performs. This comes back to the idea of the testing in the market. And of course, if you're getting your software out quickly, and you can get your software out reliably, you get some information about what's happening, and then you can respond to that change. You can say, OK, we need to do something new right now. Um, there's a company called uh, IM View, who we'll talk about later on. They're one of the, um, there's, uh, they're, the, the tag, there's a great uh, blog post written called, I think, doing, doing the Impossible 50 Times a Day, and it talks about why they got to where they got to in terms of how they deliver software. They came up, I think they came up with something like it was like a, they do like virtual goods and things. They came up with the virtual bubble heads for, I think, the presidential candidates. Um, and uh, they, they came up with the idea, and they wrote the code, and they shipped it in two weeks. And then they made no money on it at all. And they weren't annoyed with the fact that they made no money on it. They were annoyed with the fact that it took them two weeks to find out they were going to make no money on it. Um, so they, for them, two weeks was too long. Uh, so they collapsed their cycle significantly down because they actually said, you know, they're embracing the concept of, you know what, it's okay to make a mistake, but we're going to make a mistake really, really fast. Uh, we often talk with our delivery practices, our development practices, with things like TDD and CI about failing fast in the development sense. They run their organization from a business model sense to fail fast. 
And the way you do that is by, getting your, by, by breaking up big change into small changes, getting those small changes out to the market, understanding what your customers are doing with that change, and then working out what to do next. Um, well, so how do we get there? I mean, why, why are we not all doing this? Why is it only startups that are in this space right now that are really doing these sort of five releases a day type activities? Um, probably worth talking a little bit about uh, history of where we've been going over the last 10, 15, 20 years or more. Um, but before that, I mean, let's think about the basic steps, because I suspect a lot of you right now are, are, are doing some CI practice, you're doing some agile practices, and, and uh, a lot of time I spend with customers is talking about what are the stages that you need to go through just to get you there. And unfortunately, like all of these things, it's, it's not always easy, uh, but uh, it, and it's obviously quite iterative. There's often just a whole load of stages of getting the fundamentals right. Uh, most of you in this room have probably got the fundamentals right. And when we need fundamentals, we need really, really, really basic stuff, like having clear roles for your team. Uh, having your code checked in is often a very good place to start from. Believe it or not, it does still happen. When you go in, there's just some basic rigor that comes in. You might be getting towards, at this point, having or you're starting to get continuous integration flowing, by which I mean every check-in to the same place, checking in on mainline, and actually having that built and all those sorts of things. These are really basic fundamental things. And then really there's a rabid uh, focus on automation of everything. The thing that Jez and Dave talk about in the continuous delivery book you know, is about <coughs> finding the pain and bringing it forward and automating it away. This isn't just automation in terms of your builds, in terms of your, your uh, functional tests. It's automation in terms of your performance tests. It's, aut it's automation in terms of your deployment your push to production, the whole works. And actually, that, that sort of goes hand in hand with something very important that often gets overlooked. This is the concept of right-sizing. Um, we spoke early, especially earlier about this idea of someone with a two-weekly release cycle. They might have a quite rigorous automated deployment process into a production environment, reliable two-weekly deployments. But their, their features were taking six months to get through because they weren't right-sizing them. The units of work that were moving through that process were just way too large. You need to actually start working at breaking those items down. And often these two things go hand in hand. If you've got a very big, complex manual process, it's very hard to say, right, without automating it, we're going to start sending lots of small chunks through. Often you need to do some automation, some right-sizing, some automation, some right-sizing. These things go hand in hand in hand. You're collapsing that unit of work down. And all too often, this is, a, this is not just about sort of working more closely with your customer or finding an appropriate customer proxy. If you can only get hold of your stakeholder every, every six months or so, you're going to have to have someone they trust as their representative on earth to make this happen. It doesn't sound like new stuff, does it? It just it sounds like customer-focused and design. It just sounds like agile, and guess what it is? Um, this is also, though, uh, about, um, you know, you might have to change your fundamental applications. I'm going to talk to developers about this. I'll say, no, but, but that's not how our application works. Or, no, so our technology doesn't support that kind of level of change. OK, well, then change your technology. Um, what's more important than getting features out fast? Um, you may need to re-architect how your application is put together. This is especially important when you're considering uh, development practices like branch by abstraction and those sorts of things. But also a number of people I've spoken to are, are, are moving database technology stacks from relational databases to non-relational databases, and they are justifying it purely in terms of lower cost of ownership and faster turnaround of new features. You may well have to change your technology to get that unit of work down. And this process, you know, takes what? Well. You iterate, iterate over it. You chunk it up. And, and the last thing you need to bring in is this... This, when you're talking about continuous delivery, is this, this constant measurement, this drive of measurement and improvement. Um, for many people, uh, we, you probably have retrospectives at the end of your sprints, at the end of your iterations. It's a place, it's a time for reflection to think about what's gone on before and think about what we're going to improve going forward. Um, how many of you, actually, when you go into your retrospectives, are able to sit down and talk about real-world measurements about what's been going on not just in terms of how many points you've done, but in terms of how many defects were raised, in terms of the cycle time, in terms of, in terms of the time from an idea out into production, production defects, business statistics. 
we're often making decisions in those sorts of exercises without all of the information we need. And then how many of you are then turning that around and saying, right, what are we going to do differently in our process based on that data? This is, this is, the, this is the really you know, the hard part as well. This is all kind of hard, but that's all right. I'll make you lots of money. Um, the, the idea that there's some one-size-fits-all process that comes out of the box that we, we give you and it just works. No, this is actually a discipline. This is a rigor. This is professionalism, in my opinion. This is about saying what we've got now is good. Where are we going to go tomorrow? Uh, many people and many of the people in the startup movement aren't using more rigid, iterative processes like Scrum or XP. We often forget, you know, there was this set of th these, the principles called the Agile Manifesto, and nothing I'm going to talk about today is anything other than what's in the Agile Manifesto. But that's been lost over time. If you read the original uh, Scrum book, it talks about developing features for your sprint, your 30-day sprint, and then releasing those features into production. I have never once seen a scrum shop, even a completely by the book scrum shop, that actually does that. They might release every month, but it's not the stuff they just worked on. Often this structure that we place up, people are doing by the book agile processes and are missing the underlying principles. The people in the Lean Startup movement are moving more to, to, to less structured uh, agile methods. Things like you know, Kanban, more flow-based approaches. We have to remember that the iteration kickoff you know, the steering group, the showcase, the retrospective is ceremony. It's ceremony. These are, these are places where we are saying these activities have to happen in that box. I have to prioritize in my iteration kickoff meeting, and that's why I do my estimation. I do my reflection about my process improvements in my retrospectives. And that ceremony is fantastic when you're starting off. It's like scaffolding. Any Rails developers out there, Rails gives you this scaffolding where it quickly brings up some basic looking UI, but you can kind of see things hang together, but it's scaffolding because you take it away and you put something new up. A lot of us are, you, are, are, have taken this ceremony and have, have originally thought, that's what we need to do. Well, why is, it a, why is it a week a week? Why is that the only time at which you have those conversations? This is all about saying, you know, we should feel free to even change those things. Nothing should be sacrosanct. Even for when we're just starting people off uh, on Agile and, and, and you know, the sort of a a Agile methods, we don't get some book and do exactly what it says in Scrum or exactly what it does in XP. We pull together what makes sense for that organisation and, and you guys should be doing the same sorts of things. And this is very core cool to what's going on here. So uh, why is this all happening now? Why are we talking about this? Well, we started off with uh, Waterfall. Uh, which, which was a lot of fun at the time. Um, you've got like four big phases. Uh, you can have really good parties when you move from one phase to the other. Uh, you have some time here when you write the spec to just slack off and uh, not do any work. But you know, these things could take months, years to actually produce some software. And the problem we found with this process was I came up with some idea at the beginning. It took me ages and ages to write the code. I get it out. I eventually get it in the hands of my customers. And a couple of things happens. One, uh, it's years since we talked about the specifications. And two, the cost of changing your mind through that process, very, very hard. So roll on, and we moved, so people started adopting more agile practices. And really what we moved to is sort of fairly rigid, iterative-style development. Um, what we had was we broke up the big piece of work into lots of little pieces of work, which gave us a great opportunity to change direction. Uh, it, it, it doesn't reduce the cost of changing your mind to zero. What it does is it tries to reduce that cost as low as it possibly can be. It gives us the ability to move around. But often, the release cadence hasn't changed that much. And what I mean by the release cadence here is not, am I releasing every two weeks, but the release cadence of idea into production hasn't actually changed that much for many organizations that have gone here. What we have with the iterations are lots and lots and lots of data points to gather information about our flow. We may only be tracking velocity, but that's still useful information. Although, you know, we've kind of just put a progress bar on our delivery. And as we all know, progress bars don't necessarily make things go faster. So we kind of need to be collapsing these cycles down and not thinking about getting the idea into production in months, but really shifting to, to days or hours. And so everything I've talked about here is not brand new stuff. It's all it's saying is we're taking the original ideas of the Agile Manifesto and we're really moving that forward into a new area, into a new realm. And part of that 
And part of the ability for us to make that step forward is just because of a whole load of things are coming together around new ideas around how we develop software, about new technologies and new tools, about people showing us there are different ways of happening and making big successful companies out of different ways of working. And it's all these things coming together. We're just saying, you know, actually, it's just giving more impetus to, the, to, to some of the agile development methods out there to move on to something new. So what are all those things that have come out that are changing the way we're thinking about how we deliver software? Well, some of the groundwork has come out of just new development practices. Here we're thinking of things like functional automated testing. We've done a lot of work in this area, things like WebDriver and Selenium. Uh, we've just done Frank, which is um, uh, for iOS testing that the guys in San Francisco have done. Um, these are things that give us the safety net that allow us to go fast, that free our uh, QA people up from doing manual button clicking to actually being able to do exploratory and user-based testing. These are the build is green. I know, therefore, my regression suite at least pass, and I've got a pretty good feeling that my, functionally my system works. It allows us to go fast and it goes, allows us to go safe. It also allows us to be brave in deciding to change our application in some fundamental way to keep it supple. We've got the concept of code on mainline, which is what you should be doing if you're doing continuous integration. Quite often, people who do continuous integration still have loads of branches. It means you're not really doing continuous integration. So coding on mainline and things like branch by abstraction to make that work. So if you want to release lots of small features and you want to be coding on mainline, so you want everyone thinking, going onto the same branch in your software. What happens if you want to release halfway through a feature being ready? That's what branch by abstraction is about. It's a theory that actually the cost of managing half features that are turned off in your code is significantly lower than the cost of managing multiple branches of code. And everything we've seen uh, in our experience in ThoughtWorks has told us that this is true. Um, one of the very, very first things we do, and we talk about the fundamental stuff earlier on, one of the very, very first things I do when I do consulting around this area is, is take a look at their version control repo, take a look at how long lived all those branches are, and start working towards removing all of them. This is sort of where some of the architectural changes might need to happen to your application to make this stuff possible. Uh, this, is, this is very real. We do it for most of our applications nowadays, and we're not the only people. Uh, People like Google do make heavy use of, uh, of, of feature toggling to implement branch by abstraction. The original paper by Paul Hammett's worth a look. And there's also non-functional automated testing. I've separated that out because there was a bit of a drive towards functional automated testing because we only needed maybe one or two boxes for that. But often the thing that stopped us doing a lot of automated functional testing in terms of performance testing was a lack of availability of resources and infrastructure. Um, we worked with a lot of clients to do a, um, that you're using AWS, for example, many of them start in the realm of performance testing because it's very hard to go and get hold of the production-like machines from your business just to do performance testing. It's very easy to, in an API call, and bring up about 20 machines on Amazon and do your tests there. So we're seeing a lot more people doing uh, automated performance testing, which, again, is key. You need to understand how your application is going to behave. You get away. When we talk about testing in the market, we, we mean testing a business idea, not testing if your application actually works um, from a technical point of view. There's a whole lot of build and deployment patterns here. Uh, build pipelines, the idea that you can take some big monolithic continuous integration build and break that up into little fragments, which you tune for fast feedback, um, was, was quite important. A lot of that came out of our experiences uh, at uh, Dixon's, where we, we got support where our build became an hour and a half. We talk about bringing pain forward. Um, we had something that painful that 50 developers were having to do every day. Guess what? That got solved fairly quickly in terms of a whole lot of new ideas and build patterns about how we, how we did that. You know, we, brought, we didn't wait to do our integration. We just made that better. Um, a lot of what Jez talks about in the book, uh, and Jez and Dave talk about, is about how you construct your build pipelines to break up your delivery cycle, to give you more data gathering points, more monitoring points, all those sorts of things. And most of the serious uh, tools in these space are at least trying to give you views of build pipelines now. Uh, canary releases um, is uh, it literally just like sticking a canary into, your, into the mine to see if it dies from gas. This is the idea of uh, rolling out features to a, to a small set of your user base to understand how it performs. Um, there's kind of a whole lot of different ways of doing this. There's the Google approach, which they, they talk about 1% testing, where they'll... Their, their systems are so large that they run multiple shards for different customer bases and direct certain customer bases with certain set of shards and machines. They'll push out a version of the software to a small shard somewhere. 
So, for example, the search algorithm. They'll tweak the search algorithm, roll it out to a certain IP range. They'll see how, what percentage of our users on that new version click the first link on the search results versus the second link. If a high proportion click the first link, we kind of feel confident that that algorithm is actually an improvement over the old one. Maybe we'll increase that trial. It's often you know, also called A-B testing, very coarse-grained A-B testing. Sometimes that can be an application to behave slightly differently for different user bases. And some of the uh, multivariant testing tools out there do things like that. Others, it's I'm going to take my user and send them to a different version of my application. This is, this is how you go about doing the testing, some of the testing in the market stuff. You push it out to a small section of your users, thereby reducing the risk that you're going to have a big revenue impact if you put out a new idea. And uh, another key idea is uh, infrastructure as code. John Allspore, who was the web operations manager at Flickr and is now CTO at Etsy, wrote a book called Web Operations. In there's a chapter called uh, Infrastructure as Code that was written by the CF Engine author. It all talks about the idea of you know, codifying your infrastructure, how you provision your boxes, what, what, what patch level on those boxes, everything, and representing that in a code form that can be version controlled, that can be checked out and run in, in a, in a, in a re, you know, repeatably and reliably. And there's a whole lot of tooling that's brought, brought up, come up around the infrastructure's code concept, moving away from these ideas of things like Tivoli Blade Logic and all those sorts of things that require expensive consultants from Capgemini to press buttons for you. Um, you know, these are sort of democratized infrastructure control systems. These are things like Chef, uh, Puppet, and CF Engine. These are declarative tools that allow you to make a statement about what your production system is going to look like. This is what my production system is going to look like. These are the versions of things that I expect to be there. These are the files I expect to be there. These are the versions of the system that I expect to have available to me. That stuff can be version controlled and it can be tracked. For any of you in a heavy regulatory environment, if, you're, if you've got SOX or Corbett or ITIL or anything like this, auditors love stuff. Auditors love stuff like these tools. Why? It's not a manual that writes about what your operations guys have to do to bring your software into being. It is a rigorous, version-controlled, repeatable, and traceable process by how you bring your systems into being. And the great thing is you can run pretty much the same stuff through your entire development cycle. You can run the same stuff in development, in QA, and in production. Um, CF Engine is kind of the granddaddy here. The guy who wrote CF Engine wrote the original infrastructure's code post. Chef and Puppet are kind of the new kids on the block. Uh, I've been spending more time with Puppet recently. Puppet comes more from the sysadmin space. Um, both Puppet and Chef are Ruby-based tools. Uh, Puppet uses an external DSL, which means when you're defining your Puppet manifests, it's not Ruby code, it's, but it's, it's a relatively terse syntax. Chef is just like using Ruby. You're, you've got a Ruby library. Um, I would say using either Chef or Puppet is better than not using either of them, if that makes sense. Uh, I tend to veer towards Puppet. It's a good reason to use Chef too. Both of these systems also have solutions for centralized server models where you can get a high degree of control and actually even do some machine management and machine control. To give you an idea of what's possible with these systems, this guy called Henri Pinar, who's, uh, if any of you hang out in the DevOps community around London, will know about. Um, he's, he runs about 1,000 machines for startups. He's a freelance sysadmin. He runs machines for other startups. He runs those machines by himself with a part-time, pimply-faced youth who sort of works with him. And those are in multiple data centers around the world. And he's running about 1,000 machines with that sort of infrastructure. It's the same sort of level of, of, uh, of, of sort of sysadmin to box ratio that Amazon have internally. <coughs> Chef, uh, he uses Puppet, a system called mCollective, to do that orchestration. Chef was written by uh, ex-Amazon EC2 people who realized, OK, we can now bring up all these thousands of boxes. Now what the heck do we do with them? They left, come, created a company called OpsCode, which created Chef. Both Chef and Puppet are open source. You can get commercial support for them. CF Engine is the same deal. Has been a bit longer, too. If there is a new version, haven't looked at it. Might be worth a look. These systems are not from an IBM or a HP. They don't require UIs. These, this is about code. This is automation. I can't automate easily button clicking. And the other thing you hear is infrastructure as a service. And actually, these things have kind of reinforced each other. A lot of this, these tools were coming out of the operation space anyway. But a lot of developers and you know, tech guys like me suddenly can launch 50 machines on Amazon. And now I go, well, now what do I do with them? So 
the, the infrastructure service stuff has really reinforced it. You know, I can now support more and more and more machines at a higher scale with the people I've got available to me. I don't actually have to bring loads of people in. This does mean a whole lot of new skill set, though, for the people in this space. Which, uh, and, and there's also, as I mentioned earlier, when I build pipelines, the, the tooling in the space about managing that life cycle from code checking to deployment are getting better. I think goes the best, but we write go, and I have to say that. And uh, Jez buys me beer every time I get a go sale. Or sell 10 copies of his book. So if you want to buy a book from me, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, he's trying to build a shed in his back garden at the moment. He needs book royalties. Um, the tools out there now are saying, you know, we, we're not a build loop anymore. We need, to be, we need to aspire to be more than that. We need to aspire to give you traceability of your pipeline. We need to aspire to be able to trace exactly what's happened to a version of the software all the way through that process. I need to be able to rerun that pipeline for six months ago if I have to for an auditory or compliance reason. I had a conversation with a, a, a bank that got caught up in the, um, in the, the JP Morgan... Uh, uh, um, uh, oh, who was a big company? Went, Lehman Brothers, default situation. They got tied up and it was legal legislation. And we were doing some work with them and they were writing these stories out for us. And, uh, you know, one of the things that came back was uh, a story said, as, as, as whoever, I need to recreate the state of my running system at any given point in time, including the operating system patch level, the contents of the message buses, and exactly what's in the file system. And I said, this seems a bit of a crazy, a crazy thing you want to do here. I says, well, what's the motivation? Because clearly, I'm, you know, at this point, I'm thinking we're not just gold plating, we're platinum plating. He says, well, um, I got subpoenaed uh, to go to court to talk about what was happening in our systems when Lehman Brothers went default. Uh, and we then had to manually recreate, to, to, as part of this legal action, I had to, had to manually recreate the running state of our system. And the only way we could do that was by going through debug statements in the logs and then working out what we needed to poke on the outside to bring that system into a state of being. Um, you know, the, the, everything they had was so manually cobbled together, they had no repeatability of the build. It's something we hammer home again and again and again and again, again. If you have a build pipeline, you need to be able to recreate that build pipeline at any point in time, which is one area where, um, where it goes valuable. So when you're looking at those tools, make sure you understand the limitations of them. They are all getting better because everybody's moving in this direction. Uh, DevOps talked about, oh, it got a bit loud there, sorry about that. Um, uh, we talked about this automation of the last mile. Uh, that means, you know, from the development world, reaching out to people that we probably haven't traditionally had a very close contact with, especially if we're releasing production software every six months. They may be in a different building, they may be in a different country to us. Uh, all too often, um, uh, developers are rather arrogant. We go along to our operations team and say, right, here's some software. Just please deploy that software for us. Thank you very much. And why are you whinging now? Um, it's, it, from an operations point of view, what they see is every time they see this release cresting over the horizon, they think it's some masked gunman come to drink all their beer and steal their families. That's all too often because these bits of software get thrown over the wall to operations teams and fail in a new and interesting manner. Because every big release of a software is a big change. It starts behaving in a very different, different way. And those developers don't have to support... Uh, that software we just put out there, they just have to deal with the pain. Because you're releasing infrequently, you're not having those conversations often. You've got this big silo. And, also, and also, the, 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 in the operations world, it's quite often the people you're talking to in operations have to support multiple different work streams. And you might want to say as a developer, why can't you use my build process? Why can't you use my deployment process? Well, probably because the guy you're talking to supports 25 other work streams as well. How are you going to start talking about doing something different for you. If you want to collapse these cycles down, if you want to right size, if you want to release often, you need to build very good relations with the operations people. This is not like a one-way street. A lot of this is actually being driven from the operations side as much as anything else. They started seeing agile practices. They really made Kanban for things like ticket management and those things. A lot of the automation tools in this space have come from the system administration world. It's these sort of two groups of people coming together and one of the major things they're fighting over and trying to resolve, actually, between them um, is that development teams and, you know, get incentivized by how quickly they can turn around change. It's about the features, it's the points. Change, change, change. Operations people are incentivized primarily about stability, as in nothing breaking. Now, all too often, six monthly releases, they get thrown over the wall, break stuff. So they tend to push back because it breaks things. Um, 
There are lots of different ways about how you bridge this. Now, DevOps is not a role. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a movement like the Agile movement. It's a set of ideas that are relatively fluid. But it's about saying we need to work a way out a way to bridge these two groups. I have seen at least uh, one concrete example of, uh, of, a, of a very la la large consultancy saying the way you solve DevOps is by putting another team between operations and development to ma handle the trade-offs. Uh, and when the question was asked, well, what happens when that becomes hard to work with? Well, you we say we put another team in between those two teams. And that's not the point. If you are doing DevOps and have a DevOps person that handles all that interaction, you're doing it wrong. You, know, you can have DevOps specialists who understand that world and help coach that group of people to work better together. Um, but that shouldn't be a rigid role. Um, what we're seeing is developers needing a bit more awareness, actually, about what happens in production. Amazon, again, actually embraced some of these ideas fairly early. They, they, they took the decision that they wanted small, cohesive teams that focused on a product they're putting out. In their case, they deploy individual services. Um, they might, when you go to the, the home page, there's probably about 10, 15, 20 services that get called to construct that home page for you. There'll be a service that makes the recommendations to you. There'll be another service that shows the basket contents. All of those services are owned by small teams, what they call two pizza teams. And a two pizza team is a team that's, that's small enough that can be fed with two pizzas. Now, admittedly, American pizzas are large, but even so, that's still a small group of people. But that team, though, is, you know, works out what needs to be done, designs the system, builds it, tests it, puts it into production, and supports it. They carry pages. A remarkable thing happens when developers carry pages. They start writing software that is really easy to support to ensure they never have to answer their pager. Very, very important. Uh, things like that, you know, if you're trying to move into the operations world and, 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 and trying to build bridges from a development world, maybe you should have the faith in the software you created to carry a pager for your system. And if you don't feel able to, then I think you need to ask yourself a question about what it is you just created. Because if you don't trust the system you created well enough, to not get woken up at 2 in the morning, then, you know, think about what you're doing. So far, I've talked very much, though, about development practices as being an impetus to thinking about doing something new. But the other probably thing we should talk about is the Lean Startup movement. There's a guy called uh, Eric Rees who has been trying to pull together some of these ideas and kind of came up with these terms. It's very hot right now in the startup world. Um, it's based on three, well, originally three core principles and has since been augmented by a fourth. And the first principle it's based on is the idea of embracing free and open source software. Why does that matter? Well, there's a few things. So if you're a lean startup, you would rather not have to go to investors to get money to do stuff because that takes time, uh, and time is money, which gets confusing. So I don't, the, the, the less money I need, probably the quicker I'm going to get into the marketplace, which means I go open source. I'm not dealing with some technology vendor. Yeah, I don't have to you know, sign contracts with them. Um, if I'm putting money down, I've got to do due diligence with the money I've been given. I've got to do trade-offs and all those sorts of things. So a real embracing of open source software. This is something the enterprise space has been doing in spades. Unsurprisingly, in these, these times of economic hardship, not giving lots of money to Larry Ellison for another yacht is looking quite attractive. Um, it's also based on a lot of our ideas from agile software development. And again, the word lean here gives you an idea that this is probably at the more extreme end, the flow-based agile methods, more so than the standard iteration-based methods. These are Kanban-type shops, those sorts of things. Um, these are people that are turning around features in days and hours, not in a week, because that's how long their iteration cycle is. Um, very, very <coughs> focused on customer-centric. The D, don't know where the D came from. Uh, well, I, I did this in Manchester. My slides started automatically transitioning themselves as well. So there's been all kinds of weird things happening for me. Um, I can't blame uh, Microsoft. This is a keynote. Um, the idea that it's not just about, it, it's about getting things in the hands of the users. Again, getting it out there, getting it out there. And the, probably the new thing that's come in, I think, this wasn't, didn't come from Eric Reese, it came from another group of people, talking about powerful, cheap analytics. Um, if you want to get stuff out and know how your users are using it, you need very good data that tells you about what's going on. Uh, this, is a, this is traditionally a space dominated by big vendors. Uh, you go to a standard web shop and you say, what's happening in my site right now? And they say, oh, hang on a minute. Let me go and ask the Omniture consultant what came in our Cognos cube for the, for the site. But we'll have to wait two days because that's how long the cube takes to do its transformations. 
Uh, how much are you paying for that system again? Oh, a lot of money. And does it do exactly what you want? Not really. Um, it's, it's kind of weird that often this is simultaneously not seen as being important and yet also something that people are happy to spend a lot of money on by going to some outside party that gives you a one-size-fits-all solution. It doesn't seem to kind of work for you. These guys are sort of, well, if you want to focus on free and open source software and you want to put features in the hands of your customers and understand what they're doing so that you can turn them around quickly, you need to know what your site's doing. Understanding what your site is doing is as important as the feature set on that site. They would rather put out a leaner feature set with awesome analytics and anything else. So they write these things bespoke. What is it I need to know about my site? I will build that system now. A lot of stuff coming out in the NoSQL space is really helping here because it's, it's putting in the hands of you know, all of us the ability to store and do work on massive data sets. This isn't a proprietary vendor-driven space anymore. A key, a key thing to think about right, is for some of these organizations, their analytics system being down is as bad as the site being down because without this, they're flying blind. At the point when that's happening, you really understand what's going on. This is key to understanding how to tune your process. What you should think, do is when you're thinking about putting out a feature is how do I know that feature is performing well? And if I can't get what I want off the shelf, build it. This is very much an emerging space, though. I think there's no, it's not like with the chef and puppet where there's an obvious go to's in this area or frameworks yet. But there are lots of building blocks out there for you to construct and pull those things together. If you're doing a web shop, for example, you probably already know how to do JavaScript. If you know how to do JavaScript and build server side software, you can build this stuff yourself. OK. So let's imagine in our brave new world that we're, we're right-sizing, we're automating our everything. Everything's automated. The, the tea lady's automated. Uh, the security guard's automated. The deployments are automated. Everything's automated. Paychecks, pink slips, anything's automated. Right? You break the build, you get fired. All that stuff has been done. We're embracing all these ideas. We're getting features out into the hands of our users on a daily basis. We're iterating fast. We've got piercings, and we're all based out of Shoreditch, and it's all awesome. Silicon roundabout, sorry. What's happening now? What's it all look like? Where, 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 what's, what's the world look like to us? I kind of have a, I think my goal as continuous delivery practice lead is partly to try and get to the point where the delivery we do for our customers is all based around these ideas. And actually, you know, I'll be happy when I can go in to any one of my customers and see something that looks a little bit like this. A, a production dashboard, and yes, the colors may be different. It might be rounded fields. It might be a rich client app or a web application. And it has uh, three very simple things on it. The first thing I see is a set of business meaningful metrics that help me understand how well is the system in production fulfilling the goals that I have as a business. This could be orders I have placed. It could be revenue taken. And this will be t telling me useful things. It will, be, it will understand trends. It will understand what I would expect to see versus what I'm seeing now. I will know that on a Tuesday afternoon when I'm looking at this site, I would normally expect to be taking 350 orders an hour, more or less. And I'm actually taking 250 orders an hour. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Do I know why that might be happening? For those of you guys using um, uh, infrastructure services that are doing on-demand pricing, you will probably have a run rate on here. You'll probably have a, a ratio of orders taken to money spent on infrastructure. And you'll be able to understand if you're in a good place or a bad place. This is, this is not CPU use. right? That's useful when you need to dive into a problem. That might be useful from an alerting point of view. Business meaningful metrics tell me what's happening. And the key thing is right now, not in two days from now. Now. There's no reason why we can't do that. Another thing we see is a, just a very simple list of all the things that are going to go into my next, uh, in, in, into the next release. You could click on that if you wanted detail. Uh, so you click on that, go into Mingle, which is obviously my favorite. Other tracking tools are available. Um, but you, know, you can click on that, go through, and see what's going on if you want to, but in the next release. So I know what's going to happen. I know when I go into production, that's what's going to go in. If you're getting really fancy, you might have an understanding about revenue projections off these things. I don't know. You know getting a bit too extreme there. And a third thing, which is a very big button. One button that you can press, and that when you press that button, it goes into production. Now, it's kind of up to you who has access to this dashboard. But if technically you can't be building this thing, 
and know that when you press on that, exactly what you expect to happen will happen, and that it will all work seamlessly. If you can't do that, then you, you, you know, you've got more work to do. There's no reason why every single one of us should not be aspiring to be able to do this. And if we're not, we're not pushing ourselves hard enough. And you know what? If you're not pushing yourselves hard enough, your competitors at some point will be. Because at some point, they'll realise you're not doing this, and they'll just come along and you know, take your business. That was a scary bit over at number nine. Say it again. Right? But of course, this is all pie-in-the-sky stuff, right? No one's really doing this. These are all fly-by-night web companies that are doing this. They don't have real customers. They're not making any money doing all this stuff. And you guys are all from big enterprise shops in the real world. You've probably got IBM mainframes and they have right everything in Siebel. Probably you don't because you're in the room. But, you know, nonetheless, this is all pie-in-the-sky stuff, right? So let's talk about some people that are doing these sorts of things. Um, I mentioned this company earlier. This is Iron View. They do a sort of a social networking... 3D bubble heady avatar type world where you come and hang out and do 3D avatar y type things, but you don't get to kill any orcs. It's not like World of Warcraft. I think it's about like having conversations and stuff. Although, weirdly, I did a Google image search to bring in some pictures of what it does, and a lot of it was not suitable for work, so I, I don't know. Um, so, uh, probably just some raw developer stats. This is good, uh, good for all techie people in the room. Um, do, when they talk about doing the impossible 50 times a day, what they mean are zero downtime deployments of production software. Um, at peak, uh, and these stats are a bit old now, I've got to admit, these probably about, you know, they may have been going faster or slower than this right now, but certainly they were doing about six deployments an hour, and that means into production, uh, which means up to 50 times a day they're putting their software into production. Now these guys are right on the raggedy edge of, 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 of what you can do, and I don't think it really makes sense for everybody. In their world, if the bill is greed, it goes into production and no one has to do anything about it. It just goes in. Um, I wouldn't necessarily suggest that for everybody. I think what we're really driving to is giving you the ability to push a button whenever you want. For them, they're happy for it to just go in. They are their own business stakeholder in a startup. Into production 50 times a day. But of course, as a fly-by-night company with no real users, apart from the over 25 million users they've got who are accessing the site 24-7, the guys take around uh, 3 million revenue per month. So they're doing okay. When he started doing this, they're only taking one million revenue per month, and I think had about five million users. So, you know, they're doing well. Let's talk about another fly-by-night company with no real users that are using stuff like this. Let's talk about Flickr. It's the uh, it's the last remaining crown jewel in the now empty crown jewel cupboard that Yahoo have, um, and it is Flickr. Um, it's my favourite photo sharing site. I mentioned John Allspore earlier, and he's a very smart guy, lovely guy as well who's driven a lot of the automation ideas around deployments. He was, uh, he was basically VP for operations at Flickr. Um, if you go to a, site, a page called code.flickr.com, it talks a little bit there on that page about some of the open source software they use, but it's not the interesting part. The interesting part is if you scroll to the bottom of that page, and there's this little snippet. And I'll read it out. This was on a Monday I took this screenshot. Um, Flickr was last deployed two days ago, including one change by one person. The reason... It's not more impressive is because this was on a Monday morning and they're in Mountain View time, right? However, we think about last week. In the last week, there were 48 deployments of 345 changes by 18 people. These are their faces. You can actually click on them and find out who they are. Uh, one of the things John's talks about, I mean, at Etsy, um, the developers get a tr decide to press the button to go into production. Uh, and the big thing for them is about... Um, is, a, is, is about actually accountability. As a developer, if you're the one making the decision to go into production, you suddenly get very careful about what you do. You get a bit more professional. Again, I'm not suggesting it's something that's necessarily going to make sense for your organisation, but you get the idea about what's technically possible. The business decisions are, are something else entirely. Um, so when they got, they've been doing this for, for many years. When they got first bought by uh, Yahoo, the Yahoo guys were coming doing some technical due diligence. They took one look at what the guys were doing with this sort of process, and they said... It's crazy. For some fly-by-night company, you're only worth 30 million, right? Uh, fly-by-night company like you, we really can't trust that development process. We're going to need you to use the uh, Yahoo-approved development process, and here's all the documentation for it. And the guy says, OK, that's, uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, so we'll, we'll go in there and think about it and come back to you. So they went and looked at all the Yahoo properties, and they came back to the Yahoo guys and said, no, I tell you what, um, when a single one of your sites has a better uptime than Flickr, we'll use your deployment process roll on four, five, six years, it's still not the case. They're still using the Flickr development process, and in fact, Yahoo are now looking to adopt the Flickr deployment process for the rest of their, um, the rest of their sites out there. Um, it, it does work. People do do this. 
Um, one last example, and this is less around the frequent deployments, but maybe some more of this whole idea of failing fast and having rigor and understanding your system is going to work and be bulletproof and fast turn around the features. It's a, it's a small company called Netflix in the US. Um, I say small, two billion in revenue last year. They employ around 2,000 people, which I think is a good ratio of revenue to people. Um, they have 20 million customers, mostly in North America and Canada. The really, really impressive stat for me, though, is at peak time in North America, 30% of all internet use is Netflix. When you consider that, I think it's about 25% is BitTorrent and 17% is standard browsing. So by themselves, they are the single, uh, the single biggest source of internet traffic. And there are some projections that are saying at the current rate they'll eventually be outstripping all other forms combined. Uh, they haven't yet come to Europe, but when they do, I think all of our, yeah, all of our backbones will start melting. Um, they do video on demand type streaming activities. They actually run pretty much wholly out of Amazon now. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a success story for um, infrastructure as a service providers. One of the really good things I think about all the companies in this space, and certainly the last three companies I've talked about, including Netflix, is they're being very generous with, with their time in terms of sharing their ideas. Um, there's a conference recently called Lean Startup Lessons Learned where I and View have talked about their stuff. It's worth looking at. The videos are freely available online. There are lots of blog posts, conference talks by the guys from Netflix talking about how they made this stuff happen. On the cloud, with the infrastructure service stuff, there's lots of, they've been very open about here's what we did well, here's what failed for us. The recent Amazon production outage in North America, actually, you know, it was, it was not a good day for Amazon, right? What was good, though, was that there was a huge outpouring of information about how people were architecting their systems. So people like Netflix, who were barely affected at all, and other people who were heavily affected, they both came out and started talking about what they did to make this stuff work. I mean, these guys take the idea of everything failing really, really seriously. Um, there's a book called uh, Release It by Ny Nygaard that talks a lot about this idea. When you're operating at a certain scale, you have to embrace the idea that everything fails. If you want to release your software very, very frequently and small in small incremental releases, you need to know that you can deploy a service without it affecting a, a user's, uh, you know, user's uh, experience on the site. You want to be able to swap one service in, drop in the new version, and carry on. No one notices what's going on. One of the ways that Netflix keep themselves honest on this one to make sure they really are embracing this everything fails mentality is one of the first things they put into production in, um, in, uh, in Amazon was a little program called the Chaos Monkey. Um, Chaos Monkey is a kind of fun name program. It's very something a little laugh. Ha, 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 ha. So what's the Chaos Monkey do? The Chaos Monkey, um, every now and then, randomly turns off a machine in their production uh, um, availability zones. So if you know that your system is not, you, you, you've got to already, you, uh, when you're operating at scale, you have to embrace the idea that you're going to have a hardware outage. Amazon don't eliminate that possibility at all any more than anyone can. They can't change the laws of physics. Hard drives fail. People trip over networking gear. You have small explosions. You know, things happen to take machines out. But they happen less frequently. So with these guys, they said, right, we're going to put the chaos monkey in there. That's going to happen more frequently. We'll get really good at dealing with it. And guess what? The outage happened in the US, and none of the customers noticed. Um, these are the kinds of ideas that are coming out of these spaces. I mean, uh, I think it's the IMV, and I could be wrong, but certainly there's one company I've heard about that are doing these rapid deployments into production actually do, uh, certainly, certainly in the Netflix guys, when they see error rates, and the IMV guys, when they see error rates, do auto rollbacks. So in IMV, when they see error rates climbing, they'll automatically roll the software back. They won't even wait to ask a person they'll to take it back. And then you can do some investigation later. Uh, there's one company I've heard of that's doing that for revenue. They have very, very good data about what revenue they expect at any given point in time. They have a delta around that revenue. When they deploy a new version of the software, if their revenue that they're bringing in dips below a certain delta, they, they, just, they can't afford to lose the money. They'll just revert to the previous version of the site, giving them some time then to at least get back to a known stable state and then do some investigations. You do the rollback and the revenue still where it was, you probably know it's a market condition. And then you just roll it forward again. This is the kind of stuff that people are doing, and doing on a large scale, and doing so in a way without necessarily impacting what the customers see. Um, a lot of these people have had the benefit of starting from a relatively clean slate. And that's one benefit that many people in, the, in these startup areas have. And a lot of you in this room won't necessarily have that ability. The other thing they have is their organizations have 
built around this piece of software they're putting out into the market. The other thing that's very, that, that, that can be difficult to get right is getting all the people aligned in a different direction. Uh, many organizations where you've got the operations people reporting up to, say, the CIO, you've got your development teams, maybe you've got your BAs, your QAs, your devs in different reporting chains with different line managers. They then report up and eventually they meet at the C CTO. So often even from an operations and development point of view, you're not meeting until you're at the board. And if you're in a suitably large organization, that could be quite a way up. I haven't even talked about the business side of things. And this is actually the key challenge to making a lot of this work. The engineering practice done, you can do them. Uh, we can help you change your architecture to make some of the technical stuff here possible, absolutely no worries. And there's still value in doing that, but the, the really hard stuff is then getting your organization aligned. I think one of the things that Dave and Jess talk about a lot is this product focused idea. Getting everybody involved with delivery of your software, stop thinking about these transactional projects, get them aligned around a product that you are creating, something with life, something that has to evolve. Getting everybody on that team aligned along the business level objectives not aligned along as things as simple as you know, stability or change or anything like that. That's the hard challenge here. So what is it we've talked about? What is, what is continuous delivery? Well, just as a refresher, it's that automation of the last mile. It's that rapid, <coughs> rapid delivery of idea, to, of idea to the marketplace, or concept to cash, if you will. And it's that constant measurement and, uh, and uh, constant refinement of what it is you're doing, not only in terms of what it is you're putting into the market, but also in terms of how you're delivering that software. Um, I've used a whole lot of pictures from Flickr, which uh, I mentioned here, all Creative Commons stuff. Um, so here are the links for the video. Um, so thank you. So. So, so kind of the question was, um, how do we do rollbacks in this sort of situation? And the question was, I don't, I don't have a rollback button on my, uh, on my, my uh, diagram here. It's a, it's a small oversight. Actually, um, people, if you've got a rock-solid uh, deployment process where you can deploy small change very, very, very quickly and you're releasing very, very frequently, then a rollback should be no different to any other release of software. So a lot of times you'll hear John talk a lot about the idea of a roll back is just a roll forward, effectively. You roll forward the last version of the application. So in Go, for example, I'll have one pipeline that was my deployment, and I click the last button, it goes into production, and I do the same thing down here, and that's now into production. If I need to go back to the previous version, I just go and click that button again, and it just rolls out a new version. Because as far as the production system, it's just a delta from where I was to where I need to get to. Puppet and Chef are all about those deltas, declarative systems. So really, a rollback is just a roll forward. It should be no different. It's kind of interesting. If you do releases very infrequently, and it's a bit of a painful process, well, guess what? A rollback is too. If you can release any small incremental change very, very quickly, a rollback is, is as simple. Effectively, it's a non-event. In the same way that Netflix made a machine outage being a non-event by you know, having the chaos monkey there to keep them honest. It's the same, same principle. Same principle applies. The question was, how do you get people to let go of branches? Um, I think probably start, actually, you know, not by saying branching is bad, but, but probably the, the thing to do is focus on what's the goal. The goal of, our, of what we do is to get what it is you're working on into a production environment. Okay? You get agreement there, because you may well find they don't want to do that, and that's a different conversation. Okay, you want to get production out there. So then, you talk, and then you're just talking about the process. People often work in branches because... Um, they can't take that change and put it back into that piece of code because they don't know when that piece of code is going to go into production. It becomes a management issue about, well, what happens if I half check in my new screen, half check in my new feature? Um, and so I think the, I guess the, 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 the challenges you've got to look at is, first, you've got to have an answer to that question. How do I integrate that stuff without worrying too much about that? But the other thing you've got to deal with is, though, that you need to highlight is the pain associated with the merge activities that you've got. So um, I think you need to paint a picture of what the future can look like for them. And I think looking at some of the branch by abstraction stuff to say, look, technically, we can do this. Developers don't like merging. I can tell you that firsthand. They really, really don't like merging. And you know, as, as great as things like Git and Mercurial are, they don't eliminate the pain of merging. Quite often, the biggest problem 
actually is that you can't refactor when you have branches. Um, so I think you need to paint a picture about them. There is a different way of doing things. You need to get the, and you need to make it easy for them to check into mainline. Having a really, really great continuous integration build and having that stuff checked in. So um, yeah, have a look at those papers and, uh, and, and ultimately at, at a certain point as a, as a technical leader in an organization, you kind of may have to just crack the whip a little bit. But if you can give them at least some nice carrots around, it's a great you know, our continuous and server environment. It's awesome, isn't it? Right? And we can do branch by abstractions. Isn't that cool? We check in. You can flick your feature on, and it's all awesome. Uh, it, it's a bit of stuff like that. Um, I mean, ultimately, if your developers really, really like branching, then um, in terms of look, because they really love merging stuff, um, often where we've seen environments like that, it's, that often goes hand in hand with a culture of, of not bothering to change code, but not willing to refactor code that's outside of their realm of control. Quite often that's a, I live in my little sandbox, this piece of code is mine. I don't bother about changing anything around me, I change my little piece of code. And so sometimes you only often see the pain of that when you've been quite you know, rigorous about saying, no, we should all feel free to refactor that code base, keep it supple, keep it maintainable. That will then emphasize the pain of refactoring because you can't rename a method on a branch necessarily and have that merge back. You can't do any abstraction refactoring, for example. I couldn't find a new concept on a branch, abstract out that new concept, and expect to be able to merge that back. So in a branching environment, refactoring tends not to happen that much. People get, it gets delayed. You start building up your technical debt list. It becomes painful. So maybe sell the team on the idea of refactoring is good because it keeps our code supple and maintainable. You know, make sure they've got the bravery to do it because of the automated tests. And uh, part of it comes back to a trust thing as well. You might have to just bed your feet in. Maybe just try and shorten those branches first. Get those branches shorter. Some of the ways you can get those branches shorter as well, if they're using them for feature branches, is make the feature smaller as well. The smaller the feature, the less, less, less time the branch has to live for. OK, so the question was, um, if the cycle is sort of build, test, deploy, and the current cycle is build, test, correct, I'm quite nervous about you know, deploying and where that comes in. Um, this comes back to something I didn't really emphasize, but when I talked to a lot of people about this stuff, they focus on DevOps, they focus on cloud, they focus on automation. The key thing in the middle is that automation test process. You have to have confidence that you've got automated tests in place that mean you're going to find less and less and less stuff to correct in the first place. Um, now, that confidence does not come overnight. Um, you know, people will talk about the line stop idea with continuous integration. You find a defect and you, you stop the line. If you're going from an environment in which you don't have confidence that any of your automation tests are going to catch bugs, you, you can't turn off your manual test cycle. It tends to be a phasing approach. You bring a few tests in and you monitor what happens, how many defects are we finding later on. So you may still have to keep your manual test cycles in to start off with, but that starts shifting. Maybe it's 100% manual test, 0% automation. The automation comes in, and that manual test cycle reduces. Key to that, actually, is finding your manual testers that are capable of doing automation, or actually hiring those people, getting them working as part of that manual test cycle, and having them really drive the nature of the test, and having them drive some of that focus on that test, because then there's a sense of ownership. There are lots of tools out there that allow sort of less technical QAs to sort of define scenarios, but developers to actually do the work to implement them. Uh, we do a, test, a tool called Twist that does that. You can also look at Concordian or Cucumber that kind of give you business readable sense. I think the people, because QAs feel responsible, right? They often, so they're not often, so, I mean, Brian Marek talks about QAs as really what they should be, is the shield that protects the developers from shame. But all too often, they're the guys that stop the developers getting anything past them. And the mind, I think the thing to do, if you want to automate, I've seen test automation often driven by developers only, and you end up with a whole lot of test automation that hopefully does what it should do, but sometimes doesn't, and a whole lot of QAs don't trust it. You, you need to actually have those guys working closely together. The key thing is collapsing that process down. You want the developers doing some level of testing. It's all about having a sort of defined uh, a test strategy as well, and there's different types of tests you bring to bear. There's a great diagram that Mike Cohn talks about. It's his testing pyramid. And it shows the sort of, you, you kind of, the idea is you've got these big end to end tests that give you a high degree of confidence that your system works. And that tends to be more where your QA people are going to look at. These are the end to end slices, these are a, a customer focused things like, 
when I put 20, if I had given that I have 100 pounds in my account, when I take out 150 pounds, then I should be 50 pounds overdrawn. This is like a big end-to-end -end slice of a system. And those sorts of tests are designed to give you confidence. They tend to be a bit slower. You don't want a huge amount of those tests, but that's kind of where the, the QAs and the developers will work together in creating those tests. But developers themselves should be working on what we call the smaller scope tests. These are unit tests. So um, when a unit test fails, I can run, a, I can run that four, five, 6,000 of those in 30 seconds on my machine. Now, individually, they don't give me confidence my system works. But when they fail, I normally know which method line has got a problem. Developers should be writing those. You're collapsing that test cycle down. Google did a whole load of uh, research into the cost of fixed defects, and it drove a lot of their drive towards automation. Uh, they actually just wholesale got rid of a lot of their manual um, testers to force <laughs> their teams to adopt automation. I can't remember the exact stats, but there is a paper out there about it. And I think they found that the cost of a developer finding a defect was about $50. I think some of the cost of a QA finding a defect was about, it was like $500 to $5,000. And the cost in production was significantly more. And when they got that stats out, they loved numbers. That was all the impetus they needed to say, you know, collapsing those test cycles down is important. But developers should be writing some tests as well, absolutely. But it, it can be a phasing approach. Yeah. So the question was, have you had any experience of working with big companies, getting the whole thing into the cloud, doing DevOps practice? Uh, yes, globally we have. Obviously, I'd say that. Um, we've done a few different things. And, and often, you know, we talked earlier about building trust with developers, about the branching, building tests of confidence with the QAs and the testers around testing. It's the same, same deal. Uh, and a lot of places is you start somewhere first. You start somewhere low risk first with those organizations. Obvious place actually tends to be performance test environments because I, I suspect most organizations you go to do not have anything like a production led performance test environment. And they're kind of happen, and often they don't see the need. Amazon's a really good place to start with that. Um, I mean, we've done things with like, you know, a tier one US retailer building their whole DR site out in, in Amazon. Um, it's almost like they've got a completely parallel data stack because they don't want any interdependence with their other system. Um, and uh, one of our clients actually moved their whole, uh, they're one of the really early adopters of Amazon's VPC service, which gives you a virtual private cloud, really blowing the lines between public and private, you know, running over your, your own VPN. Um, and they, they were they was looking at saving about $100,000 a year in just in terms of infrastructure costs. Um, the nice thing about all the Amazon stack is it's really amenable to automation because you've got an API-driven approach. But we're also working with um, the OpenStack consortium. We're on the, we're on the board there. We're working with people like Rackspace to develop um, clouds, automated, automatable API-driven clouds that come on your own infrastructure. You know, people have data centers already. There's no point going to them and saying, you should use Amazon. Well, why? I've got machines. So we're also working with those organizations to help roll out private clouds inside their own organizations, do the same sorts of things. Uh, and it's not an all or nothing. I mean, yes, Netflix have decided to go all in um, on, on Amazon, more or less. Um, I, I tend to be a little bit more hesitant and risk adverse. Uh, Zynga is a really good example of sensible use of, of the cloud. You know, these are the Farmville guys. And Gargarville, there's apparently a little Farmville offshoot for people who like Lady Gaga, where you sell meat dresses. Um, they start on Amazon when they've got a new offering. When they don't know what's going to happen with their user loads, they use Amazon to get them the flexibility to grow or bring machines up or from machines down while they're working out what's happening. They get some weird growth spurt, but what's unexpected, they can take the extra load by just bringing up more machines. But once it settles down to steady state, they start doing proper cost-benefit analysis of what's running on Amazon versus what they could run elsewhere. They identify parts of that system and then look to bring as much of it as they can back inside in a, in a cost-effective manner. So they're actually do, they've got a foot in both camps because actually, for some users, your own internal infrastructure may be better than others, uh, than, than, than Amazon may be. Uh, we've got a really concrete example internally. We run, um, there's a couple of instances where we run a high number of VMs on one physical machine internally that actually the VMs are completely performant enough for us and it makes perfect sense. But we've got control over how much we slice that box up. Um, now, if we were to take those VMs, even using the smallest VMs available on Amazon, it would actually cost us more money. But we use Amazon for other stuff. So it's, it's actually a bit more of a, a blended world now. And it's not as cost grain saying there's the public cloud and then there's the private cloud either. Um, I mean, with Amazon VPC, that's kind of, you know, that's no real different to any other multi-tenancy managed hosting. 
You can even do single tenancy machines now on Amazon VPC. At that point, it's like going to Rackspace and saying, can you run some machines for me? And I'll log in. You know, so I think the world's getting a little bit more murky. Thank you.